Today we have Enrique Javans with us. He's a real estate managing broker, investor, and property manager. He runs Javans mm -hmm. Property Managers, and they are based in Seattle. Thank you for being with us on our show today and taking time to being with us. So tell us a bit more regarding um, your background and why did you, uh, why the real estate? Why did you get into real estate? Sure, sure. Well, uh, let's see. A little bit of my background is that actually I, I got my degree in business administration okay. and went into the hotel industry to start with. And so uh, most of my career w was actually in, in the hotel industry, some 20 some years. I worked for Hyatt Hotels and for Marriott. My most recent position was as a uh, general manager with Marriott Hotels in Palo Alto, California. And then we had some uh, family up in Washington State. Um, and so we used to fly up every year to, to visit them. And the cost of real estate there was significantly less. Uh, it was maybe 25% okay. of what the San Francisco Bay Area was in, in cost of real estate. And so okay. it was something that um, we did have a rental uh, at, at the time when, when we were in the Bay Area, in addition to, to the home that we owned. And so we knew we wanted to get into that. I wanted to progress. I, it, it was funny in the hotel industry. I thought, oh, I've made it. I'm top dog. I'm the general manager. Yeah. <laughs> <But> then, <laughs> well, I realized, oh, yeah. <laughs> realized it wasn't quite the case. Yeah, not, uh, right. there's, there's still the owner of the, the hotel that I had to report to. Sure. And so um, one of the things that... Um, that, that came about in my transition over to real estate is is reading Rich Dad Poor Dad sure. that book and that's a big one and then yeah talking about going from you know a paycheck sure, to, sure, sure. you know to owning your own business to becoming an investor and all about and the so I'm, I'm on that yeah. track yeah so so now I'm a business owner but uh, but my next step I'm trying to go for is is just to become the investor uh, just own the business. In, invest in in others, but um, try and progress to that. And, to that how, next may, and uh, how, how long do you run, you have this company? So uh, for just over nine years now. Nice. Was, uh, when I left, yeah, I and, left Marriott and started my own business. And, yeah. And how many and how many units do you guys manage? So right now we have uh, 685 altogether. Okay. Uh, about about a hundred of those are ones that I personally own. And the other 585 are ones that I manage for other property owners. But you, you said you're pursuing uh, to, to become a, a full-time investor because you, you still don't have enough income to be completely off. Is this is what you're saying? Well, uh, it's a matter of... How, how much is... is, is, is yeah, how much is enough? Yeah, yeah, you're not, like Clayton Morris says, like your freedom, your freedom numbers. So. Right, right. Um, I probably could right now. I probably could step back right now and I would be okay. Um, but what I figure is, you know what, I'm young enough and I have enough years ahead of me. I'm, I'm energetic enough that I'm still still in it full time. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But I, but I have made investments um, just recently with, uh, with three other uh, companies and so We'll see those now are long term investments. Sure. And, and so you know, I won't see that money for, for quite some time. But um, but I am starting to, to try and go that direction. And, and you yeah. do, I want I wanted to do this because, um, as, as you know, as, as an entrepreneur and most people, we I think all of us, we suffer from this time biases because it's like instant success to instant uh, thing, instant weight loss. Oh. But in reality, you don't go through the all the all the the messy stuff and what I wanted to, to understand is oh, yeah. how long did it actually take you to be from from the this sure. hotel until you are actually now so that the time yeah. span yeah. until it kind of uh, went through the break-even thing and then started mm -hmm. to come come coming to make sense yeah when I left my uh, hotel job I had about uh, a I figured out that I had about six months um, to live off of. So okay. like six months one way. All right. So um, left, I bought, um, cashed out on, on the house that we had, the, the rental that we had. We purchased 13 unit uh, apartment building to start with. And for the first three years, as, as we're buying, 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 it was tough. So it was definitely three years of just really nervous, anxious, 
um, really working hard, long hours. And in the beginning, you know, I was out there, I was, uh, you know, cleaning every single vacant unit that I had um, because, you know, I was worried about spending money to, you know, uh, um, and, and I had a little more time available. Um, so it was myself doing all the cleaning, doing the painting, getting the units ready, doing all the showings, all the bookkeeping, everything, 100% myself. So it, it took about three years to answer your question, to, to get up and running to the point where I was comfortable. I've got a family of five, so I've got three kids. And, and so, you know, I, I had a lot at stake there. I, I didn't want to, you know, be putting them at jeopardy. So um, it was about three years before I was finally, finally comfortable. And when you, when you started doing this, uh, did you like uh, partner up with someone? Did you win all in by yourself? No, I was lucky enough to go in all by myself. And the reason was because I had saved up enough money. Um, we had always been putting money away into savings and into a retirement plan. Okay. And also um, because the, the, we owned our house in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, for 15 years. And so the the house had appreciated significantly in value. And so we were in the Bay Area, we were kind of cash poor, but house rich. Sure, sure, and, sure. And so, I understand. <laughs> and I so understand. We, we cashed out. And that that's what gave us the runway. That's what gave us the opportunity to do it by ourselves. If we hadn't, then certainly, yeah, we would have had to have partnered up with somebody else to, to find the money. And because do, do, would you say that property management is a business that is in in demand? Or do you think it does an oversupply in this usually like this vertical integration of existing businesses that find the need to start property managing their own thing? Property management is a, uh, a tough business to get into. It's one of these businesses that has a very high barrier to entry. Okay. And what I mean by that is that it's just, it's hard to start because, and so that that's good because it keeps the competition. Sure, back. sure, sure. So it, um, it does require, in the United States, uh, it requires a real estate license. Okay, so there's one hurdle. The, uh, not a big hurdle, but <laughs> the one. thing is, yeah, okay. is then, so that's number one. This, the second part of it is, is that you're only making, you know, a percentage of the rents collected. It's just a small percentage. And, and so, or even if you charge a flat fee, it's, it's going to be a minimal amount. Sure. So if, if after all expenses, you're only making ten, twenty dollars per unit, you know, and you know, in the beginning, maybe you only sure. find ten clients. You got ten <laughs> units. You know, you can't live off of two hundred dollars a month. You know, you starve to death. Yeah. And so that's why I mean by it's a high barrier to entry. It takes a long time to get started. Now, once once you get up, so that's what, you know. Now it's six hundred and eighty-five units. Sure. Okay. Now. You know, if I'm only making profit-wise twenty dollars a unit, oh, okay, now it's it's a pretty decent um, decent amount. And actually, now the economies of scale help too. So sure. um, actually, our profit margin gets better and better with with the more units that we take on in management. So actually, our profit margin is even larger than that. So but but that, it works out well. Hearing you mm -hmm. hearing you say that, that would make sense if. Um, if I was a property manager, I would only be accepting projects that would make sense for for us a uh, company fi um, financially. So it would make yeah. sense for you, from what you are saying, uh, to only take projects that already have, well, you look at it and say, okay, we have economies of scale here. So we, we on, only take projects at like 100 plus units or something like that. Is this, this is what you're saying? It, well, I, ideally, yes, but but the reality is, no, I still have a lot of owners that just have one single family home. So of those 685 uh, units altogether, I have about 170 different owners. Okay, so so that, that's like having 170 clients, right? The Some of them are just one unit, and unfortunately, a bunch of them have a lot of units. The in in a perfect world, I would only take on um, properties with with a lot of units because this, right, the, economies the scale are better. Yeah, the, the, it will allow yeah. you to to grow. And do do you have a relationship with uh, outside investors? Let let's say um, a European investor saying, okay, we have uh, this project we want to invest. We have no eyes down in the terrain. We have absolutely no right. point of reference between street A and street B. So. 
Do you provide this service to foreign investors? Uh, about 90% of, of the property owners that we manage for uh, live out of the area. Okay, and okay, great. That's probably their number one reason for hiring management companies because they live out of the area. So about 90% live out of the area. The Of those 90% that are actually foreign, maybe I would say about between 10, 20% is a guess of mine are, are people who are living abroad. Um, and it's in all parts of the world. <laughs> So, so there, there's yeah. So so uh, a foreign investor because uh, we're doing this this show as you know is just to help mm -hmm. um, yep. uh, outside investors out of the U.S. to get into the multifamily business. And of course, you need partners you can trust. So this is yeah. hearing you from your end to understand exactly what w uh, they would be expecting. So basically, you would be yeah. collecting all the rents, taking care of all the messy stuff, and they only be collecting a check. This is what the property management company does, right? Yeah, we're, uh, there's there's a lot to it. Probably the biggest part is enforcing the lease and and making sure that the building is not getting destroyed, right? Sure. I mean, it's it's a huge investment, a huge asset, and so that's that the number one thing is you know keep the place intact, and then of course you want to bring in the the income and make sure that you know we're spending the owner's money wisely on on repairs that we're not, you know. Um, sending an electrician every single time when a handyman can do the do job just as well. And also uh, making sure that if it's uh, something that the tenant caused, that we're, you know, getting the money back from the tenant, that we're billing the tenant and collecting back from them. So there is, it's a lot more than just collecting the rent. And even collecting the rent is actually difficult <laughs> because you know what? <laughs> Uh, yeah, tenants start out great, yeah. and then you know people get divorced, yeah. and yeah. then they have health, uh, medical issues, calamities that come up, or they have a job loss, and and these are all difficult, you know, unexpected situations for the tenant, and so then it becomes, you know, uh, difficult for us, and that's where we really kick in and and make sure that you know we work with the tenant and and get the money. But, so uh, yeah, there's a lot to it. <laughs> but but they, uh, but as, as an investor, they would uh, see a, a kind of a how would they know exactly what's going on in their property? Do they get like a report, yeah. seeing exactly what's going? How how does this process works? Can you can you explain a little bit? Sure. So the um, and one reason to make sure you know as an investor, don't cut corners. Don't try and sure, scam. Sure. My my you know advice is make sure for sure that the person is licensed. So in anywhere in the United States, you have to be licensed, the, the, which is a very good thing because the Department of Licensing, Department of Real Estate Licensing, then actually audits the books uh, periodically of um, of all the real estate companies, and so and that that's very important to make sure nobody's running off with your money. Um, the um, the other part of it then is yes the that we're required to send out monthly reports. And so we send out, uh, we actually send it out twice a month, but but it, at minimum, you would expect to receive a, a monthly report. We, on those reports, they're, they're, for us, there's three different types of reports. There's, um, it's called the rent roll, which has the, sure. the name of all the tenants, their contact information, how much uh, they're supposed to pay in rent, what they actually paid in rent, and what, uh, how much of a security deposit we're holding for them. So you have that report. The next report you would always want to get is an income statement. You know, very basic, you know, income statement showing all the the money in. So rents, or you know, there might be laundry machines or other types of income, and and then all the expenses and any repairs. Uh, you might have also, you know, uh, insurance, taxes. Um, utilities, any any other type of expense, and, and then our management fee. And then with that, you would be able to see then your net profit. Okay, the third report we send out is more like a checkbook register. So it's going to show every single payment received and every single payment that went out and and who got that money, who received that that check. So th those are the three reports that we produce. The other thing we do are inspections, which is very important uh, to owners to make sure that the property is being cared for. And with that is uh, the beautiful thing now, thank goodness, is, you know, digital pictures. And so it's, yeah, there's no excuses anymore sure. not to take 
you know, hundreds of pictures. And so that's, that's the big Part of it too is make sure you always demand pictures and so yeah we're always taking you know pictures from before the tenant moved in then periodic inspections when the tenant's living there and then pictures when they move out um, get the place fixed up and then start all over again so that's the, those are all the important things but but with all that you know with, with your financial reports with uh, your pictures that's how you can be assured that you know that the place is uh, still standing and, and doing well. But let's say John and Mary uh, got married, they're super happy, and now they live on 2B on your property. My question now is, uh, they're now starting to not understand each other very well, yeah, uh, right. uh, screaming and shouting every, all over the place, <laughs> <laughs> and then John yeah. and Mary uh, decide to, to call the quits. As an right. investor, you don't know <laughs> what's going on with John and Mary, as you uh, I, I would guess so. Uh, that prop, that um, that unit is now vacant because they went their separate ways. My question now is how how can a property manager step in and get the vacant unit uh, up to place and another guy in it? Well, getting uh, okay. So um, the the other nice thing about having a, a lot of units for us is then we've got vendors, you know, uh, how you know cleaning companies, you know, handyman, plumbers, electricians. We we have them a lot of them that are just working, you know, for us. Okay. So so that's the beauty of it is that we can control their schedules and and uh, because they want the repeat business, they're going to sure. do a good job and, and you know because we're keeping them employed full time. All right. So the um, yeah. So well, we are somebody moves out. You know, we we go in, we document everything, take pictures of how they they left it. We always, of course, have a security deposit on hold so that any they they have to leave the place exactly the way they found it. Sure. Is the criteria. Sure. All right. So anything that we got to pay, you know, a housekeeper. So we do, of course, all the scheduling and the sending out and. And then the supervising of you know all the, the people. So um, we go out, photograph. We assign all the work. It gets done. We go back, make sure it was done properly. Take all new photographs again. We then send all the bills for anything that wasn't normal wear and tear. We send you know a, a bill. We deduct the money uh, from the security deposit, and then we. Um, you know, send them a, a refund for whatever remaining portion they might have. And if the charges went over what the security deposit is, we send it to them. They have 10 days to pay. And if they don't, then we send them to a collections agency to try and recover the money that way. The um, normal wear and tear, the, the owner ends up having to pay for, you know, if the carpet's sure. you know, 10 years old and that sort of thing. But, but the, do, um, do you make, but do you make sure then you can fill in the, the vacant, the vacant unit or? Uh, just yeah. Like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, for us, again, a bunch of units, we are always advertising 100 percent, you know, uh, the time 365 days a year we're advertising that, that we've got properties available. And the reality is we've always got some something available or we've got something coming up so then we if somebody we don't have let's say somebody's looking for uh, a four bedroom uh, house um, by the lake and we don't have that right at the moment uh, we'll we'll take their name we put it on our wait list and as soon as it becomes available we contact them let them know okay you know what somebody just gave notice and it's going to be available at the end of this month um, you know, we do the, the showings, you know, make arrangements with the, you know, current tenants to go show the property. We then uh, go do the showings for the prospective applicants. We do all the background checks, everything like that. So, yeah, getting the unit filled fast, doing that turnaround fast, as, as fast as possible, is obviously very important because just like when I was in the hotel industry, you know, every single night that goes by, if there's a bed unfilled, that's that's money lost forever. It's just the same as the airline industry. You know, if there's a, a seat on that flight that goes empty, that's the reason why they discount. Everybody pays a different rate because sure, sure. they got to get those seats filled. It's the same with us, you know, and, and um, you know, and all of my staff knows that, you know, time is money. And so we got to get these places, you know, fixed up, cleaned up fast and, Turned around fast. And, and what's and the, what's the usual? There. And what's I, I know. Uh, of course, it's always different. Mm -hmm. But 
if you could average it out uh, in this particular scenario, what's the usual uh, time span in between a vacant unit and getting someone in again? Yeah, uh, our, our average is about two weeks. Two, uh, weeks. two weeks is the average, yeah. And so um, part of that time is in the, the cleaning and, and getting the unit ready. And then part of it is also that not every tenant is ready to move in exactly that same day that it becomes available. And so that's where the average um, is, is two weeks. So if you, you know, and the average, so um, like if you're budgeting, you know, you're, you're looking at a, a property, you want to determine the average um, vacancy rate that you want to plug into your equation is going to be between five and 10%. So 10%, if it's kind of more of a, uh, a rural area um, with, with a, a smaller, you know, smaller location, smaller city. Uh, if it's a larger city where demand is very high, then 5% is fine. And, and the reason I say 5% is because it, it's not necessarily that the view is vacant, but also there, are, you, you have to build in the, the fact that not everybody pays 100% of the time. And so if you end up kicking somebody out, you're going to have a month of lost rent. And so on the average, 5% in, in a busy area, 10% in a slow so, so we are, we're looking, of course, at uh, stabilized properties, and it's a, yeah. a, a B-type property. This is, this is a, a, the typical target that we're talking about here. Yeah, and, and so then the range is, yeah, if you're talking about, you know, like a C, you know, a, a lower income. If you're talking about a lower income property, lower income locations, then you're going to have to account for more maintenance costs. Usually the buildings are, you know, not as good condition. They're older buildings. And so that you're going to have higher maintenance costs. Maintenance typically runs about 5% of, of the uh, gross rents. All right. But it's going to be on the higher side for the low income stuff. And it's going to be much lower for the upper income location. So if you have a nice new house and it's an upper income area, you might go an entire year without a single maintenance request. And and you might, you know, and, and the person, um, definitely higher income locations, they are more apt to pay, sure, you sense. know, they, yeah. I mean, yeah, they, they get divorced too and they have their medical <laughs> problems too, but. <laughs> sure, not, not but, uh, that. yeah, okay. Yeah. So, but on but on the whole, yeah, they do much better. Yeah. Sure. T tell me, tell me one thing. All your properties do you have like um, it's all within the same the same uh, range, or do you have like um, completely s uh, separated in out of state uh, properties? And you yourself are situated where you are. Yeah, uh, manage. We run the full spectrum. So I've got um, houses that are three, my, over 3,000 uh, square feet um, on a golf course by a lake that are just in, in a gated community, incredibly beautiful properties, just amazingly beautiful properties. All right. And then I've got it that where it runs all the way down to, we actually have a mobile home park that we're managing. Okay. And in the mobile home park, it is where these poor little mobile homes are almost like made out of cardboard and, and tin. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, I know. that's the other extreme. So we, we had the, the two extremes. Um, but the reality is uh, the paper, a lot of it's the same. The paperwork is the same. It's just dealing with the clientele is, is different. And, and so um, you have to be able to both talk to a highly educated you know, doctor, physician, software engineer, and at the same time, you know, the next person who walks in the door is is somebody who has absolutely no education, and and so therefore has you know horrible coping skills, uh, you know, and that's that's where you get in these lower income apartment buildings where they just don't know how to get along very well. They're just, you know, so they can be very difficult. Now, those, of course, are the buildings where oftentimes they're cash cows because uh, as a result, there's fewer people who want to invest in those properties. So then those properties be, end up being <laughs> cheaper to purchase, sure. right? Because they're so difficult to manage. Sure. So um, so that's where your cash cows. So then it, it becomes up to the investor. You know, do you want to have a lot going on in a um, kind of high risk, high reward? 
or do you want to just go with the safe but it's not going to produce you know much of a return with the with the higher end property so it's uh, Enrique, it looks like look your business is, is doing well in and and you have this thing covered where do you see do you see your company in the next let's say five years well, where do you see your goals regarding your pop property management co company we're growing at a little over 50 units a year right now is is uh, our growth pattern so um i i do expect net growth is because sometimes you know we sell properties of the owners sure, sell sure, properties. Sure, understood, understood. so the net um net growth of about 50 units uh, so um definitely continuing to to grow i uh we're in the state of washington and so for sure we're, we're expanding within the state of washington i've connected with a group of software engineers and we've uh, produced now a, a research tool uh, a website that is available for uh, real estate investors um, right now it's uh, for the seattle uh, washington area Okay. But that that um, software program, we we expect to to go nationwide with it. So that's one of the investments that I've made, and uh, that seems to be going really well. So um, hopefully, yeah, very big big things coming up. And re regarding your in regarding your investments, regarding your own personal side of it, uh, what what type mm -hmm. what type of uh, type of deals uh, deal size? What type of uh, thing mm -hmm. are you looking at? Okay, everything that I'm doing, 100% of everything that I'm doing is um, is buying. Um, I'm then uh, and I buy with cash uh, using a line of credits now. So so now I have these line line of credits based on equity that I have in the the properties that sure. I currently own. Sure. All right. So then I kind of pool all those small little bits uh, line of line of credits pull them together and then I can write a check and I can buy a, a property with cash. So that, that cuts down on my closing costs significantly. I then go in and will rehab the, the unit, get it all fixed up, get the rents up. Once I'm able to, to get the rents up, then I'll go approach a bank and get a conventional loan uh, on it. If it's uh, So in the United States, if it's one to four units, you can get a conventional residential bank loan. Sure. If it's five, five plus, units it's or it's, it's a commercial, commercial loan, yeah, just means it runs, you know, typically one percentage point higher on the commercial is really the basic difference. Uh, but um, so then I'll, I'll refinance it, pull that, pull all that cash out. Typically, I'm able to get most all, if not all, and sometimes even more than what I put into it. So then it becomes a no money down. And sometimes I get more cash back than what I went into it, uh, you know, if I'm able to get the rents up high enough. And so um, get all the money back and then I'm able to go do it again. And so um, I typically, right, right now I've got uh, three of those projects. Uh, and how um, many unit, how in, many units each? How many units each? Uh, one is a, a fourplex, and I just finished up on, on uh, refinancing the fourplex. I have a single family home that I'm just about finished with the rehab. Um, that was one that I purchased at auction. Uh, then, and it's a nice big house, a four bed, uh, two, two bath, uh, large uh, single family home. Then I've also got, a, I bought it as a fourplex but I added a fifth unit to it and another unit um, I okay. expanded quite a bit. And so now it's a fiveplex and right now I'm going through the whole loan application part of it. But it's a, uh, it's, a, to, it's, a C, it's a C2B value at play or what, what are you looking specifically in, in the, the property? What, run us through a deal yeah. that, that you really like, like a typical deal that you look at and say, this is my, my type of deal. Yeah, okay, so the, the deals that I'm doing, um, are uh, the stuff that I'm doing is is predominantly I would say on the income side because for me it, it's more affordable and cash flows better and I'm willing to to work with uh, that clientele is is fine with me. So um, it would be typically uh, I would say two hundred thousand dollars cash. Okay. Uh, for the for the purchase and that would be a fourplex. So a fourplex two hundred thousand dollars cash. I would then 
get the rents up, um, get it, uh, probably put in usually about 10% um, of the value, so $20,000 cash in rehabbing it. And then I would uh, be able to get the rents up to where the gross rents would be about um, $2,400, and which would then get the property value to be about 240,000. So in my area, it's about 1% of the, what I'm looking for is, is properties where the gross rents, monthly rents equal 1% of the value of the property. So 2,400 in rents, we'll get a valuation of $240,000. So then I, I pull the, um, I'll do a conventional loan on that, uh, leave 20% equity in of on, on 240,000 and pull 80% uh, and how, back out. And how many, uh, when you're looking at mm -hmm. a deal, how many, uh, how much are you looking to net per, per, uh, per unit? It's, would you say it's like 100? So then, yeah. So, so when I purchase it at, uh, $200,000, those rents are usually $500 a month rents. By rehab and fixing up a little, I can get, let's say, uh, 600, so not get the value up a little bit, sure, um, sure. where the, the rents become $600 in, in rents. So you, so, so um, you could, you could net what you're saying, you could net 100 bucks per, 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 per unit. Yeah. Yeah. So I try and get the, right. The, the, the rents up a uh, hundred dollars that allows me to refi it for, for a much higher value. And that allows me to get my money back out again but, but, and then go do it yeah, again. But, but you're talking about, uh, already, um, tenants already in it or it's vacant and then you yeah you st i i prefer with tenants in it only when i go to purchase something only because that assures me a couple of things it assures me that the place is livable <laughs> and <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, it does assure me that there's an immediate income okay now i do still buy with vacant units because sometimes it's a great opportunity, but of course I beat down the, the seller because let's say, for example, a $200,000 property, 500, you know, four units, $500 rents. All right. If the place is, is full, then I know it's worth it. Sure. If the place is half empty, if two of the units are vacant, now I got to wonder why, why would sure, a seller be sure. selling when the vacants are unit, sure. you know? And and so I'll tell them I can't give you full value for a place that's half empty because you know, I'm gonna, units, right? Yeah, that that's a high risk. I, I don't. Why is it vacant? Is it you know maybe there's something really bad or wrong about the place they can't get it rented out? So um, so I'll, I'll beat down the seller pretty good on on you know anything that's vacant. But if I can get it down, then yeah, then, and, then and, I'll still purchase it. And what's a typical holding period for, for each uh, property that you have? You're looking to sell it after some years? You're looking to buy and hold forever? For me, yeah, for me personally, I'm forever. So my, my, the, the idea is that I'm going to pass these down to my kids. In your, in your area, do you think there's still a, um, a demand for, for the, um, the area that you're at? Or do you think there would be other interesting areas like the Midwest or the Sunbelt area? Some other. Uh, what would you recommend uh, an outside investor to start looking at? Yeah, so definitely the the Midwest Sunbelt area of the United States. That's actually where you're probably going to get your highest return, and the, those are the areas where the uh, you know, for what you purchase, you're, you're going to be able to get even up to like a 2% um, uh, of the rents versus the, the purchase price. And so that's where you're most likely going to get your, your highest uh, return on investment. The, you run a little higher risk, you know, so it is the whole risk reward thing. And the reason I say that is, is because those are areas where if the economy starts to turn, those, those are the areas where, you know, the, the economics are, are a little bit less than, than the coastal areas. So, you know, with the East Coast, New York, the West Coast, uh, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, all, all those areas, if, if there's a, a recession and, and such, 
those are going to be the last hit, uh, you know, if, if they get hit really at, at all. Um, so it's more the, the middle. They could take a little bit. However, everybody needs a place to live. And then also the, the safer bets, in my opinion, are, are also on the lower end, the, the lower, a little bit on the lower income stuff, because if, if there is a recession, it's the more expensive places that get hit hardest first. Everybody still needs a place to live, and so people might, you know, trade down in, in what they're purchasing or renting, but, um, but they're still going to need a place to live. So it, it, and the United States is very safe as far as real estate goes um, because the, you know, long tradition of it being all um, private investors. You don't have to worry about the government coming in and taking away anybody's real estate. Enrique, all, all of us as, as business people, we have horror stories regarding our own mistakes because our own imperfections of the, well, the way that we perceive things regarding our own logic. Can you tell us regarding your worst, yeah. your, what, one of the worst mistakes you made in business and one of the experiences that you came out of it and saying never going to do that ever again? Can you share with us? Yeah, the, the worst purchase I ever made was actually on my own single family home when I moved uh, because when I left the Bay Area, I felt like I was uh, flush with money. I felt like, you know, I had all this money. And so granted, I took um, most of it and started putting it into investment properties. But at the same time, I built my own uh, single family home from the ground up. Nice, big, beautiful, everything I had always wanted type of a house. And essentially what I did was I overpaid for it. So okay. I let my emotions get away from me there. So the, um, so I, now, since then, we tried to sell it, it didn't sell. So now we're in the process of refinancing that, that property. We've moved out of it now, um, nine years later. And uh, we're now um, in a home that um, is, is just more suited in a nicer area, but maybe not as, as big of a home. So that was it, it was letting, letting my emotions get away with me. And uh, that was the only bad investment that, that you could say we made. All, all the rest have, have worked out extremely well. And regarding, if you're looking for properties for your, to pass to your own kids, I would guess that you would be putting some extra work regarding understanding exactly if this is a type of property to, to hold forever. So what I would like to know is what's the typical time that yeah. you t uh, use in order to look at a property and making your, your decision? It's like a couple of minutes now, or it takes you like a month in order to decide if you are going to do it or not? No, you gotta be able to move fast. So the thing is, you gotta like, in, in my opinion, what I do is, is I focus on a particular region. You know, uh, so for me, it's Washington State, okay? So I'm, I'm focused on Washington State. Every time I, I start, you know, I, I hear all these great returns that people are getting in the Midwest and, and such. And I think, oh, I should go by there. But then what I, I would start to realize is then I kind of lose focus. And so what I would say is, is pick an area that, um, that looks good to you and stay focused on that area. Research that area constantly so that as soon as you see something come available, you can, you know, move on it, jump on it right away, immediately jump on it. Because you have your, you have your own criteria, you have your own criteria already established. Yeah, yeah, get, yeah, exactly. So you got to, yeah, establish your criteria, figure out your area. Also, I would highly recommend who you're going to work with. So, um, you know, before you, you know, you're researching the area, but then you need to find a company that you're going to work with, find your your team, you know, put together your team, your, your real estate agent, your property manager. So you, you get your team in place and ready to go so that as soon as you see something, they can jump on it, move fast and, and get it done. Because if it's a good investment, you're, you're going to run into a lot of competition. 
Yeah, it ma makes sense because usually the, these these types of deals, I would guess, you wouldn't be looking at them at loop net unless something went uh, went wrong and nobody wants them anymore. So these usually are uh, off market deals, right? Yeah, a lot of off market, but I still find deals on the market, and sometimes it's because it was listed poorly. And what I mean by that okay. is is not every single real estate agent is is brilliant. And so <laughs> sometimes I see some good Lots stuff. Of stuff. Okay. So sometimes it may Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so sometimes it's just it's priced badly or it's listed badly or there's something that you okay. know people see they don't like they stay away from it but the reality is that it's a it's a good buy so i i wouldn't totally discount the fact that something is listed does not mean that it's a bad buy okay gotcha um and also you gotta always look at the listings to have a good feel for what the market values are so that when you find your off market deal you know it's a good deal because that's the other side is that just because it's an off market deal does not automatically make it a good deal so you have to always keep keep your eye on everything and what's what's out there so that when you see something good you you can recognize it and realize yeah no this one's a good deal but besides this how how do you get your your deal flow do, do you uh, do some direct mail do you use some brokers what what do you use besides this uh, these cases what do you do on a, on a consistent basis in order to get some deal flow before you can do your own analysis yeah in the beginning for me it was looking on the mls and seeing you know what was what was available over time, what's happened is now is establish a reputation in the area as being available is somebody who can close fast. So reputation definitely is extremely important sure. and the ability to close fast. And so now, as I mentioned, I use line of credit. And so that's what gives me a huge leverage to to buy and and buy fast. And I, and also because I know the area well. That means now I'm very, a uh, very decisive person. And so when I get a phone call, either from a wholesaler, I get a phone call from, or a uh, getting from an attorney who's got a property. You know, their client passed away, and they got to get rid of it. Type of a thing. They need to settle the estate. And when an attorney's holding on to a piece of property, he's got to settle the estate. He's not getting paid until that estate settles. He doesn't care how much you know, it really goes for, he doesn't want to be involved right, in showings. Sure. So he calls people that he knows can get it done immediately. So I get, you know, I'll get a call and, you know, based on the address, also because I've got inspectors in, in my area, is I just send my inspector out while I'm talking on the phone to the person and I tell him, you know what? Yeah, let me give you a call back in an hour and I'll give you a yes or no decision. So hold off, don't call anybody else. Give me one hour. And I'm going to tell you yes or no, and then I'm going to close today with you. We'll do the paperwork today, and and with the attorney, and they can they can close it the same day, and and by the following day I've got a check to them. So that's that kind of reputation, you know, really helps in in being able to uh, to get things done. So that that takes a little bit of time. Um, so in the in the beginning, you got to work with, you got to find out the people who who get it done. And so you want to find out, you know, based on their reputation. So you're going to look for who's killing it in that area. Now, if you live remotely, you know, you don't live in the area and you don't know, you don't know, you know, don't, you don't have family or friends in the area to, to know who's who's killing it. Look for the look at the listings in the area. So whether it's LoopNet, it's the MLS, you know, look for the listings and see what is the one broker real estate agent who is listing all these properties and you, you know if you can see like wow there's this one broker who's he's got most all of the listings for this area then you know what that's an experienced broker that's going to be the person you're going to want to deal with don't work with somebody that has nothing going on um because, because uh, just uh, I, I did i did that um i did, um, <laughs> 
I'm a cold call guy. <laughs> Come to yeah. the marathon and the Ironman, you would guess. So it's all about the, the hustle. So um, I cold called um, yeah. the, the guys in Kansas City because I'm looking at pro property mm -hmm. in, in Kansas. And I did yep. exactly that. I did exactly that. Ah, I looked at if I was a broker, I would be showing that I, I can do my homework and I have a lot of stuff to, 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 to sell. So I cold called him and the next day, now, yeah. now I'm on the buyer's list. No, perfect. Yeah, because I just said, look, this is the first investment that we that we are making. I'm not looking to waste any any of your time. We will get in into a deal if yeah. you keep us uh, informed what you have. Because if uh, as soon as the numbers make sense, we'll get in. And it's like exactly cold call from you see plus three five one a number this big and then a guy cold calling telling him that and he said okay. <laughs> the next day, yeah, yeah. yeah so that's uh, I, I understand where you're coming from. This, this, makes yeah, sense. This makes yeah. Sense. Getting those relationships uh, lined up in advance, exactly. That's that's it. Is get that relationship lined up in advance. So now you've got your guy in Kansas City. That's a great place to invest in for sure. And so now you you've got that person lined up. Next, you got you know make sure that you have your finances lined up. So you don't want to like find the deal first and then all of a sudden. You're running around thinking, oh my gosh, where am I going to get the money from? So you get it, you know, establish relationships with with your bank, you know, with with money, and you know, really, banks are people too, <laughs> and and really, yeah, it's, right. it's all about relationships. And so, you know, I have this just wonderful relationship with the branch manager of there's uh, three different banks that I use on on a regular basis, and and so you know, I just keep the relationships going with with each one of them. I also rec my recommendation is is go with smaller banks. Um, I find them easier to work with, and they're more willing, in in my opinion, to lend also on on smaller things. the The difficulty you get with the national banks, you know, the Wells Fargo, Chase, Bank of America, the big ones, is really they're looking to work with the big corporations. You know, if, if you're coming with, you know, your small little single family home, your fourplex, your 10 unit yeah. apartment building, they're not interested. Ah, you're just the little fish to them and you want to be the big fish. Sure. <laughs> so you, you go for the, the smaller local bank. And, and you have, and they have the, the same homework looking at a one unit deal or 100 plus unit deal. You still have to run through the numbers and make some calls. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing. And plus, I would yeah. be, I'll guess that you would be providing an opportunity to, to investors because it's kind of net mm -hmm. uh, much higher so they can come yeah. on board and make sense for them. So it's always looking about the opportunity and establishing the, the relationships. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yep. I understand that. Yeah, uh, yeah definitely. Tell, tell us, uh, to, to, to finish our, our uh, talk today, tell us uh, mm -hmm. some, some of your favorite, f uh, five, um, your five favorite books. Oh my God, five favorite books. Yeah. Okay. So um, the very first one that made the biggest impact was uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I read it a long time ago, but I read it several times over. Yeah. And I did I did actually implement everything that, uh, you know, that, that he's uh, talked about in, in the book. So not only did I read it, I actually, you know, followed through on, on all the advice there. Yeah, there are other, um, the, uh, I like, other books are the millionaire next door all, all the books right now yeah, that i'm excellent. reading are, are all yeah uh financial too books um there's um also the um uh, the one thing gary uh, gary, Kel recent, gary keller yeah gary keller. yeah yeah so the one the one thing uh that i find um a, a very helpful book uh the four hour work week so the four hour work week Bill ferris I got um, that one as well. Yep, with Tim Ferriss. Uh, so that one I've also put to use. Um, I actually started working with virtual assistants before I read the book and then read the book because of my interest in it. But I'm also trying to implement all of the things that uh, Tim Ferriss talks about in, in his book, The, the 4-Hour Workweek. So I, I like that one as well. And then... Um, the Millionaire Real Estate Investor uh, was one I read a long time ago now, To I can't say that's a, had as much of an impact, but I enjoyed, you know, that, that book was uh, a good one as well. So, so th yeah. uh, how, how can all the listeners get a, get a hold of you, get in contact with you, reach you out? 
Sure. So to to find me, um, one well, you can just do a search my name. So Enrique <laughs> Chef, just sure. do a Google search. Sure. Find me, all right. Plus our bigger um, pockets but, as well. You're quite but, big there. Yeah, as bigger well. pockets. So you can definitely find me on uh, bigger pockets. Um, I and and the other place that you can find me is on uh, pelago.com, and and I would uh, suggest that website is um is it, it's a website it, it's a research tool for specifically mostly for flippers so if you're an individual who's interested in flipping in areas where the appreciation is through the roof you know and so as a result um just actually buy and hold on to it even if you don't do anything you're going to make money <laughs> but uh, if you fix it up a little bit then you make a lot more money um pelego.com that's uh p-e-l-l-e-g-o Pelago.com. It's a free website. Uh, you can find me on that website if you dig uh, deep enough on, on the landlord section of it, on the property management side of it. But um, but that website's a great website for anybody who's interested in, in buying and selling real estate. Eric, it was a pleasure having uh, you with us uh, today. So have a, have a nice one. I hope to speak with you soon. Thank you very much. Uh, Appreciate it. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye now.